All right, and we're back once again with the Lakers Fast Break podcast. It's Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here from Lakers Fast Break, Pop Culture Cosmos, Inside Sports, Fantasy Football, and Game Source. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our shows. And if you can, please give us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, or do anything that you can to support us right here at the Lakers Fast Break or... NBA Draft Junkies, because my guest is back, the awesome one indeed. He is back once again. If you can go ahead and support his awesome channel, NBA Draft Junkies, it is truly appreciated. It is the man indeed. It is Rafael Barlow. And Rafael, thanks for coming back on, on the West Coast per se, this time around. Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles right now. A a weird day to be in LA, but I'm here. So. Absolutely a a weird day indeed, but because it is still the one-year anniversary of the passing of Kobe Bryant and Gigi Bryant, along with several others in a tragic helicopter crash in Calabasas, I appreciate again you taking the time out of your busy schedule to go ahead and speak to me on this, I guess, remembering day that especially, like you said, the city of Los Angeles and basketball fans around the world who suffered another loss today with the passing of Sekou Smith from the effects of COVID just devastating as far as from a basketball journalism standpoint, as someone who is very familiar with his work, I'm truly saddened by his death and my respects to his family. But one year later, I know he would have talked about himself, uh, the passing of Kobe Bryant. So I want to hear your thoughts, man, on one year later, how you've been handling and have you been talking and reaching out to people about what's going on with, with, you know, like I said, people remembering the one year anniversary of the death of Kobe Bryant. Well, first, I want to talk about Sekou. We actually went to the same college. He, oh, okay. He graduated the the spring before I got there, but we had the same major. And um, he his name was something that I would often hear where people were saying, like, you have to meet Sekou. He's similar to you. He a big sports junkie. So a friend of mine wrote a tribute to him on um, – his Instagram, he was saying how, um, saying how like when when guys went to party, say cool would stay behind to write articles. If there was stuff going on on campus that you know, just college stuff, say cool would stay behind to watch sports. And so he had mentioned that he, he said that we reminded he you know um, we're similar in that aspect. So I had a chance to meet him at a wedding. It's probably like. 15 years ago, and because like I said, I heard his name. One of my professors would tell me, hey, you need to reach out to say cool. I think this at the time he was writing for the Clarion Ledger in Jackson, Mississippi. So um, I reached out to him. I was still a college student. He responded. And then when I actually met him, probably like, man, maybe five or six years later, he remembered me and we talked, but, you know, it was brief. It was at a wedding. And so um just, you know, as a guy that came from the same journalism school that I went to, he was someone that I, I always admired. And so um, we definitely shared some some mutual friends. So it, it's kind of tough to see, uh, you know, to see him pass at, at such a young age with a wife and three kids. And then just for it to be like, <clears throat> you know, the one year anniversary of, of Kobe's passing, it's going to be a, a rough day for you know, for the rest of our lives, for those that knew him and, and knew Kobe. So as as far as Kobe, man, I was, um, actually tweeted where I was. I think it's one of those things where everyone remembers where they were when they heard it. And I mean, I've mentioned the story before, but I was in Beijing. I was knocked out sleep. I want to say it's like five o'clock in the morning. And, uh, a friend of mine who I don't talk to often, she just sent me a text through WhatsApp and it said, oh my gosh, capital OMG, Raphael, are you awake? And I thought like, she knows I'm in China. And then as soon as I looked to my phone to respond and ask what happened, I got the notification. I don't know if it was from the NBA app or it had to have been the NBA app. And I remember just sitting there like, just kind of frozen for like nearly two hours and it was a weird time for me because um, 
it's like the Chinese New Year. So a lot of, I was in China, like I said, and all the other American players had left for the holiday. And then this is when we first started hearing about the coronavirus or whatever. And, you know, I was trying to make a decision, like, do I go home or should I stay? Do I wait this out? And I had, um, yeah, and I was struggling because I went to, I came to L.A., for Christmas break. So I was struggling getting my sleeping pattern back. So that's why I chose to stay in China during that time. So I just, I always remembered as this time where I was like isolated for a week, everything in China was shut down. I never, I wasn't like speaking to anybody for a whole day because there's nobody to communicate with. And then just being in like, you know, this apartment by myself in, in the foreign country and all day long, it's like, thinking like just in shock like no not Kobe like this <laughs> and then trying to watch like the you know they didn't have ESPN over there so only channel I could watch was CNN and you know they talked about it a lot too but I think also at that time the Trump impeachment was going on so that kind of dominated the headlines but also it was kind of sad because everything that was going on in China at that time his massive fan base in China didn't get a chance to come together and grieve. Like, I mean, I, I say if there is a positive thing is that when I got back to the States on February 1st, I went down to the Staples Center and at least the uh, fans in Los Angeles, Los Angeles were able to come together and grieve and, you know, go up to the Staples Centers and kind of pay their tribute. And, you know, if it would have happened, at a later time, then, you know, Americans would not have been able to do that. But in China, they didn't get a chance to, like, nobody could go outside. So, yeah. but yeah, it, it was it was uh, a day. And I'll never forget, and I'll close at this part. So when I, when I landed, you know, I'm flying Beijing. And when I leave, I'm trying to watch the Blazers-Lakers game. So it was the first game after everything that, that happened. And I'm watching like the pregame tribute. And then right before the game started is when my flight took off. So the whole flight, I'm just like thinking about, am I coming back in a couple of weeks? And are they going to quarantine me for two weeks as soon as I land in the States? On top of all the Kobe stuff, like all right, I, when I wake up from this nap on this plane, it's not going to be true. Then I remember flying over. So then, you know, when you're flying, you're looking out the window. I'm like, oh, I hope I don't see like the crash site. But what really hit me was when I landed in L.A. and I got off the plane. And then on the 405, there was like this human, it was like a construction that was that they were building. But on the top of the crane, they had like this massive number eight jersey. It was probably, I don't know. I can't even imagine. It's probably like 60 feet long. But that's when it really, really hit me like, okay, this is real. And I was able to go down to the memorial at the Staples Center, just seeing people grieving and crying and seeing the murals. And, you know, it's just hard to imagine. And I knew like going forward, this day was going to be a day that was going to be tough. I've actually kind of avoided watching ESPN and watching all the games and stuff like that. So it's already tough enough just seeing the pictures on social media. Absolutely, my friend. It's been a tough for a lot of people. It's been a really rough day remembering what happened a year ago today. I know you and I talked shortly about your life at that point in time and what happened. I know on a previous podcast that we did together, and I'm very grateful that you had the opportunity then and now to speak about it. In the months since, have you come to kind of grips with it? I mean, as far as, you know, the fact that he's gone, but the kind of legacy that he left. And I know you know so many people out there within the basketball world. The bigger question is as well, have they come to grips to it as well? I don't think anybody has. Honestly, I don't think anybody has simply because I think people are still in disbelief. I think some people probably haven't really grieved it. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's just still hard, hard to just to, to accept. And so, yeah, I don't think anybody will, will really come to grips. 
I don't blame you. I mean, it's it's still quite a bit of take to take in. I mean, he was so much a part of of basketball and and being one of the greatest of all time. And to die just as he was getting on with the second part of his life. I mean, he had achieved an Academy Award already, and he had so many plans. I'm sure as far as for what he wanted to go ahead and what he still wanted to accomplish, and to take someone away that soon. It, it's kind of rough because you you see the, what, what kind of man he would have become. Yeah, I think there was a kinder, gentler side. I mean, I have friends that played with him and played against him, and you you hear the stories about how competitive he was, how difficult of a teammate he was, um, just how laser focused he was on basketball, and how I used to say like, man, I wonder how is he going to live without basketball? Like, because he was so focused on it, I always wonder like, how is he going to accept the second half of his life? And to my surprise, it seemed like he didn't miss it at all because I feel like he knows that he gave 1000% into it and he didn't leave with any regrets. So I think that probably made it easier, but I know for me personally, like I said, I just question like how is he going to, you know, cope with the second half? Because if I'm not mistaken, when he retired, he had been in the NBA longer than he had not been in the NBA as far as his life. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, and he looked like he found his passion with coaching girls basketball, being a father, you know, the the mama businesses. And then I read that they said after his last game, he got up in the morning, worked out, and went to work the next day and to start the second half of his life. So he was different, you know. For me, I think it's a little different for me because I did grow up as a Lakers fan. He was always someone that I did not like, not because of anything he did, just because he always kicked my guys. But, like, there's so many – back breaking shots that he hit I, I know um I mean the most obvious is obviously like the 2000 Western Conference Finals there was another shot he hit I can't remember what year it was I want to say it was the maybe 07 I believe and it was a shot that he hit and if if he missed I think it would have changed the seating and where the Blazers would have played and then I think Brandon Roy got hurt that game which ended up he ended up playing against Phoenix in the playoffs and kind of, you know, ruining his 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 uh his body playing hurt. But it was just so many times I felt like, you know, I'm rooting against the Lakers because, you know, that's the rival. And I'd be so happy, like, oh, they're about to lose. And then you look and you like you, you see his face and the composure, and you're like, okay, he's he's about to make a shot. And it's 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 uh the Lakers are gonna win. So um not being a Lakers fan probably makes it a little different for me as opposed to someone that grew up as a huge Lakers fan and especially like the kids who, you know, if they were like five, when he first started playing their whole basketball lives, they, you know, experienced Kobe and Lakers Jersey, but I always, always admired just his drive and his determination and just his focus, which is, a skill set in itself, you know? And I always felt like if all of us, myself included, just had half of his work ethic and drive, we'd probably be a lot further along in life. Um, I used to give examples. I used to, um, I used to like uh, run an internship program and I would teach college students how to interview for jobs. And one of the things that we'd always, I'd always tell them is, you have to talk about yourself. Give me, if I'm an employer and I say, give me five things about yourself, why I should hire you. Most people struggle, right? And the example I would always use is say, look, I'm a Blazers fan. Kobe has hurt my team so many times. But imagine you're going up against the interview for a job against someone with Kobe Bryant self-confidence. If you can't match that confidence, then you're probably not going to get hired because he wouldn't have a problem discussing everything that he brings to the table, discussing his skill sets, discussing how it would be an asset. 
because he would be that confident in himself because he knows that he put in the work to be that qualified. So that was always an example I would use. So even as a non Lakers fan, I always just admired how confident he was, which, you know, people thought he was arrogant, but I mean, he, he was just awesome at just all around. So I went on a tangent there, but it's, it's definitely a, a rough day and um, a day that for the rest of our lives, we'll always remember. Absolutely. Uh, I don't think that would be under any other way right there. And I'll tell you what, I'm just so thankful that again, you got a chance to come on board today and, and share your thoughts. I mean, just such a day that we're going to remember now for the rest of our lives and, and, and what happened and so just cut so short. I mean, he didn't get a chance to finish that second part of his life. As you said, he was playing basketball in the NBA longer than he was actually, you know, the first part of his life. So it, it just tells you exactly how much it meant to him, what he accomplished and all the things that he had planned going forward cut so short. And obviously Gigi Bryan and all the other individuals that were part of that helicopter crash and, definitely their lives weren't able to be fulfilled as well. So, I mean, the Bryant family, again, my respects to them and they're trying to get through a tough day and they didn't want anybody in the NBA to go ahead and make a big thing as far as for today, as far as for the three games that were on tap today. So uh, I think she wanted it very low key. Uh, Vanessa did. So I, I'm very respectful of that, but I, I do think that we had to go ahead and remember Kobe on his one year passing. This is Raphael from NBADraftJunkies.com, and you are listening to the Lakers Fast Break. Check out what's been going on with the Pop Culture Cosmo Show and the PCC Multiverse. That is by far my favorite because it's also character driven and the stakes are high and there's much more of a mystery and intrigue to it. A game like Wolfenstein, which people are saying are one of the most socially important video games of the past 10 years. Catch our shows on radio worldwide seven days a week or at any time on Podbean, Spotify, Apple Podcasts or on over 30 more podcast outlets. Did you want to talk basketball now, or did you want to hop back on at another point in time? You th- I mean, you tell me what's what's best for you today. I mean, yeah, I know yeah. that a lot of people, a lot of people want to, you know, we're just trying to do what they can to, you know, to, to get on by. And with the Lakers doing very well right now at the top of the NBA with the NBA best record, I think there's a lot of things you can go by there. But uh, MVP wise, I know LeBron sticks out, and I've said it already on the show, but. Tell me some of the other candidates that are out there in your mind as far as for MVP. I mean, Embiid, you got to start and stop with me with MVP, Joel Embiid, and also as well, Nikola Jokic. I, I think it's a crazy to leave off Paul George. He is having a crazy year on paper. Extremely was, efficient. Yeah, I mean, it was like, <clears throat> I know he had a bad game a couple of days ago as far as efficiency-wise, but at one point it was like 50-50-90 from the floor on 25 points per game. So, um, yeah, and, and like right now, it's like 50, 48, 90, and he's shooting 48% from three while attempting eight threes per game. And the Clippers, I mean, they just lost to the Hawks today, but they were, you know, for the most part within the game of, of the Lakers. And I think they, at one point, they were tied with the best record, and then they beat the Lakers head-to-head. So, well, uh, he he and Kawhi weren't in it because of health and safety protocols, so they yeah, were not right. involved in the game in the game uh, because they were announced as part of being in quarantine. They're actually in LA with you right now. They're not on the road with the team until they get cleared, and then they might fly out at a later point on the road trip. So, uh, I, I think at this point, you know, tremendous season. And you're right; he should be anyone's top five candidate right there for you. Anyone else stick out? Because again, Joel Embiid, Nikola Jokic, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard. I think he's averaging over 30 points a game. So he's having a sensational season as well. Yeah. um, I mean, they're probably going to split votes. And I I think it could be a situation like with LeBron, maybe not this year. It it doesn't seem like Anthony Davis is (laughs) to his capabilities, but yeah, I mean, they could split because Kawhi is having like 26, 5, and 6, and he's also shooting over 50% from the floor and 40% from three. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's uh, – I think 
the league wanted to give the MVP award to Luca. He seemed like that was the guy that they probably want to push. Sure was here in Vegas. I'll tell you that. He was the odds on favorite. Yeah, just because they're not going to give it to Giannis three times in a row. Um, I, I figure Har- um, you know, Harden, no. Then with, with Harden and, and Brooklyn, I think him and KD would split votes. I figured, assumed LeBron and AD would somehow split votes. And I, I just thought it would be Shaq and Kobe all over again where – neither one of them has the MVP trophies that they should have because they spent so much time together, but I'm sure they would trade them for, you know, they're happy with the rings that, that they were able to win. But yeah, I mean, I, I think like right now it's, it's probably going to be in B simply due to voter fatigue. And I mean, you can put LeBron as the MVP every year and, and you wouldn't go wrong with it. So who knows? I guess it, it would depend on if the season is finished hmm. and how many games teams play. Like, you know, I, I just don't think every team is going to get to 72 games. No, it doesn't look like at this point. I mean, Washington's just back on the floor. Charlotte's still having issues. Anybody who's playing those teams are shorting themselves at least one or two games right there for you. So I don't think that the majority of the teams at this point are look like they're going to hit the 70 game plateau to pay out the regional sports networks. Otherwise they're going to have to go ahead and I think get a a payment back that the regional sports networks are going to get back from these DMB teams. If they don't meet their 70 game requirement, it's just going to be, you know, some money out of the league even more. And and I know that's an issue going forward. I did want to ask you Brooklyn. We briefly touched on it here with the MVP voting. But you know the big trade, since we talked, James Harden has gone over to Brooklyn. He's become more the facilitator to start off with, playing more the point guard, not scoring the way you want to see him scoring because he's he's been more of a facilitator. How do you think it's going so far? Defensive issues there galore. I know that's a problem for a lot of people. I know that's a problem for the team itself. But how do you think they're handling it so far? Well, I mean, they only gave up 85 points last night. <laughs> so that's 85 points in today's NBA is... <laughs> that's really good. It's really good. Um, as far as Hart, I think he's just trying to feel his way around. I mean, not a lot of practices. He's overpassing. I've been able to watch all their games. He's had a couple games, I think, where he didn't even take a shot in the first quarter. He's force-feeding passes to DeAndre. He's looking to get everybody involved. Seems like at some points he's trying to pick his spots, but they're, they're going to need him to, to be aggressive. I think they'll figure it out. I mean, you look at when Miami, when they had their big three, I think they started off like nine and eight. They struggled, and this was with a training camp. Yeah. The Nets haven't had a, any type of training camp. Probably, I don't even know if teams are going to have a full practice right now, if I'm not mistaken. I know they can't have like 10 guys – they can't have a full team in, in meetings in, in some states. Like I think in here in California, you, they have to like have – they can't have their film sessions all together, if I'm not mistaken. But, yeah, I mean, I think they'll figure it out. I think they've replaced the Clippers now as the most hated team in the NBA because any anybody that is considered a threat to the Lakers and their fan base is going <laughs> to like really dis, dislike that team. I mean, they're going to get a big. They'll be able to get another big, whether it's the buyout market or or um, some three-team trade. I mean, I saw the rumors about JaVale. Possibly. I don't know if he's necessarily the answer, but I really like Reggie Perry. I mean, I think he's young and he's a second-round pick, but I think he could end up being one of those guys like what Golden State had, like Jordan Bell or, or Kevin Looney guys that came in as a backup and just kind of played their role well or efficiently for, you know, the minutes they were given. So I I really like what they have there. Just the problem is DeAndre just doesn't want to go out on the perimeter and teams are going to be able to eat on mid range shots because he wants to be near the rim so he can get his rebounds. And, but that's their problem. If they can find another big that can switch, and at least, you know, contain ball handlers and, and, and not be able to break the defense down, I think they'll be okay. 
you and I had spoken before about our picks for the season, and you and I both picked Brooklyn versus the Lakers. I ended up that time picking the Lakers, in which I'm still holding on. You at that time picked Brooklyn. Has your thought process changed with the trade now that actually the big three there a little bit less depth, but you think they're going to get a big, I think they're going to get a big at some point. I don't know if they're defensive issues, like you said, which was shown very well last night, as far as being on the good side for the most part has still been kind of shaky, but going forward, your thoughts on the Brooklyn team now, I mean, has your perception changed any on it after the James Harden trade? Yeah. I mean, I think they're going to be tough to stop and, and close the games because they have three guys that can get their shot at any time, three guys that can go off for 40. And, you know, depending on who you see it, if, if Kyrie is your third option, that's a hell of a third option. If James Harden is your third option, I, I think they're going to be tough. They're just going to have to figure it out, get some time together. But the way the season is going, I think there could be a break again. It could be a pause. And whoever comes out of that break with chemistry and, and is, is going to be the best team. I mean, we saw it last year. The, I mean, there were the rumors that the Lakers were practicing during the quarantine or whatever. And I don't, if I'm not mistaken, the Lakers didn't look that good in, in the, the seeding games, but they no. were able to turn it on. Because they had the two best players on the floor every night. Yeah. And then all they needed was their their role players, you know, guys like Rondo to come in and make plays. KCP was, was big. And I think if Brooklyn can just kind of figure things out, it's, it's going to be tough to beat that team seven, seven times in a row. In the best of seven. In the best of seven, yes. Well, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see. Again, you and I had them for the finals. I know you had them winning. I had the Lakers winning. I don't think that's changed. I agree with you because I think the Brooklyn three is better than the Milwaukee three, and it matches up a little bit better against Philadelphia. We'll see if Joel Embiid – Joel Embiid would have to dominate thoroughly for them to to go ahead and surpass Brooklyn in a seven-game series because that's the one weakness – glaring weakness I think that Brooklyn has because I don't think DeAndre at this point in time 2015 DeAndre is not coming through that door anytime soon so you're going to get 2020 DeAndre and I don't think that's going to be able to be enough to guard someone like Joel so I think that's going to be an issue for them unless they find some way to go ahead and find like you said another big with maybe five more fouls on them to go ahead and and help out on that but before we head on out uh, I want to add something real fast. I think oh, yeah. Bam had a big game. Yes. But I think the way to beat Brooklyn with your big is if you have a big that, sp- that spaces the floor. So if you have a big that needs post touches, I think that helps DeAndre because he gets to play post defense and he gets to stay near the basket. But if it's, You know, like if it's a situation where you have a four man on the floor that's spacing the floor and and DeAndre has to switch and leave the paint, he's going to give up plenty of open shots. So, um, yeah, I I think, and which sounds weird, he would rather face Embiid than somebody like Vucevic, who may stay outside and, and knock down five threes and force him to defend out of his comfort zone. But, Even though, uh, I mean, would you consider Embiid because he, as far as he, an outside shooter, because he, I mean, as he does like to go outside. He, I mean, he'll go like four or five times. I'm not sure exactly if Doc Rivers loves that plan, but it, it's almost like he wants to go out there. He, so you got to go ahead and because all the dirty work he does inside, you got to go ahead and feed him four or five times a game at, from three. So I don't know if that qualifies for what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, if he falls in love with it, then that actually helps the Nets out. Yeah. You know, like the game where they played Orlando, Vooch was just, I mean, getting wide open looks. He just run a pick and pop, and DeAndre would half close out, but he, he wants his rebounds. Like, I mean, that was his issue in Dallas is he didn't care about playing defense. He wanted his rebounds. And he wanted to block shots, which sometimes he would leave his assignment to chase a block, which would 
leave the big open for a putback or, or a dump off. We saw Jared Allen just get a lot of hustle points because DeAndre was out of position because he was looking for blocks. So, but yeah, they they have to find another another big. But I think they may be able to find like an energy guy in in the G League because you don't really need a big to score. If you can just find a big that can move his feet, switch, play defense, and catch, he'll get plenty of open looks. So I don't think they need like a, a big time. And the J- J- JaVale is, is just like DeAndre all over again. So yeah. I don't know if, if that helps them out a lot. Well, I was going to go ahead and ask you real quick before we head on out, and that's the Western Conference. And uh, I know you and I could talk all day about the Clippers and the Lakers and how successful they are and how well they've done so far this season. I had mentioned in our top five NBA teams last week to the Laker Hawks that I put the Jazz currently at number three and a very fast rising number three because I think they've won eight in a row. They've looked very good together. I mean, they've, they're a unit that's now stuck over a year, especially Mike Conley has now looked more like Mike Conley that they, I think a lot of people thought that was going to happen last year. What are your thoughts on the Western Conference? Denver now started to win again with two impressive road victories against Phoenix. Portland, I'm not sure what you're getting in Portland because one day they're looking real good, but they've got some injuries. And then the next day they're losing against, was it the Knicks or was it Oklahoma City? They beat the Knicks. They lost to the Thunder. Yeah. So I want to hear your thoughts on the Western Conference as it stands right now before we head on out. Well, the thing about the West, I feel like everybody is talking about the Lakers and everybody is penciling the men to to get to the finals and possibly repeat. I think it's taken a lot of pressure off the other teams. I felt like last year there was a tremendous amount of pressure on the Clippers. And, I mean, maybe it's the way they handled it. Maybe it's Patrick Beverly's talking that put all this pressure on them. But I think for the Clippers – I think it's good that nobody's really talking about them like they were last year. The expectations are are a lot less. So I think they're going to be a lot better in in the playoffs. Utah, nobody's talking about Utah. I mean, it's just, you know, small market team. Arguably, Rudy Gobert. I mean, Rudy Gobert to me is their most impactful player. And I've heard this from players that play on the Jazz, and they're like, you know, everything changes with him on defense. I mean, he's our, our identity. And, you know, when, when he's not on the floor, you can't really defend. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think Utah, and they'll probably make another sneaky good move at the deadline like they did last year with Jordan Clarkson, um, maybe adding another shooter. But uh, as far as Portland, you know, they've lost two starters. But they're, I want to say they're like two games over 500 still. Which, yeah, they're, they're nine and seven. They're in the fifth spot right now. If you would have told me a team would be in the fifth spot without two starters, I mean, that would be, I, I guess, I guess with this year, a lot of teams have been without, <laughs> without major players, whether it's due to injuries or, or the COVID protocols. But I mean, I think the Blazers will be fine if they can just hang on and, and be, you know, stay in this range till they get healthy, I think they'll be fine. But they have to get something out of Covington and Jones. Offensively, they're not getting anything out of them. I don't think they're averaging 12 points a game combined. And that's very sad to see because I know you and I were expecting a lot more. I mean, obviously to give them a defensive boost, but to give them some kind of offensive efficiency from there and and they're not getting it done. And like you said, with Jurkic out, and also you have C.J. McCollum out, and you have Collins out, I mean, again, well, never played, so I, I yeah. don't even consider him being out because <laughs> he was injured last year too. So you know, uh, the took him over Bam out of bio. I mean, that's that's our championship right there. We just draft Bam, and that changes everything. That that kills the the lack of defense. Another playmaker, athleticism like that move right there cost us, in my opinion, a championship. Well, I, right now, though, at was it the 9-7? They're still doing pretty good in the Western Conference. Right now, battling it out with the Nuggets, who are finally finding some sort of consistency in their game because it was just very sad to see Jokic having this miraculous season and just 
the rest of the team just not needing where it needed to be. I mean, defensively, they were shambles of what they once were, but it's good to see them finding their, their legs. Phoenix, their, they, what about Dallas, though, before we head on out? Dallas has been struggling. I mean, it just seems like not only like you were talking about with uh, Luca and being the MVP early on favorite and not happening because he's struggling so bad, but, I mean, there's a lot of issues going on or on the surface, I think, from what I've seen at Dallas. Yeah, I mean, you. I think Porzingis has only played maybe three games, three out of maybe, what, 15 or 16. Finney Smith and Richardson seem like they've been out for the last week or two. Kleber's out. I mean, COVID has really hit them hard. I don't think their projected starting lineup or even like their top six guys have all played a game together. So they're just kind of holding on right now. They're a game under 500. And I think Dallas's biggest issue is that everything is so reliant on Luka. There's nobody else on the team that can really create shots for themselves or for others. Like they're starting Jalen Brunson at the two, which I like Brunson a lot, but he's been starting Trey Burke. So they're starting some really small guards and, and, um, I think, you know, I know Richardson is supposed to improve their defense and toughness, but I think losing Seth Curry hurts a lot because, you know, when Luca was on the floor with Seth and Hardaway on the other other end, you could not help off either one of those guys. And so now, like, I mean, they've been playing Wesley at one I think he started, and also Josh Green. And if you saw the Toronto game, Luca faced boxes and elbows the whole game. He didn't have any driving lanes, so... I think they'll be fine once they get their their core back. And because I think just yesterday you had Richardson, Richardson, Finney Smith, Kleber, and Powell out, out the game. So that's, I mean, you can pretty much say their projected starting lineup for the year would have been Luca, Richardson, Hardaway, Powell, and Porzingis, or either if Powell isn't starting, then Finney Smith, so they're they're missing like four of their of their rotation guys. So, but I, I think they'll figure it out. Before we end on out, any surprise teams either which way that are really disappointing you that you didn't think would happen, or surprising you that are doing that well? Oklahoma City, <laughs> that's the biggest surprise to me. The biggest disappointment to me is is the Pelicans, but. Oklahoma City, they are seven and nine, which you know they're two games under five hundred. But if you would have told me that they were going to be one and fifteen after their first sixteen games, I would have believed it. Like on paper, they don't look good. I think right now their second leading score is Lugans Dort, and their fourth leading score is either Isaiah Roby or Hamadou Diallo. Yeah, but they they. Competitive. They're seven and nine. I mean, they beat my Blazers yesterday, and the fact that they have a better record and they have two more wins than the Pelicans is—it's a shame. I mean, the Pelicans are just—I don't know. Like, I, I had a debate with somebody. I want to say it was like during the bubble over which team has a brighter future, Memphis or the Pelicans, and everybody said the Pelicans. And I'm like, they look good on paper, but I don't think their pieces fit. Yeah. And the Stan Van Gundy hire, it doesn't look good at this point. I mean, it's still a small sample size, but they're playing slower. And I think with a young team like that, they need to run. I, I don't like the Steven Adams fit with Zion. I think Zion needs to be with the floor spacer, but floor spacers that can rebound and defend are pretty unique. So it's going to be tough for them to find, you know, a good complimentary piece for him. Um, but Lonzo has – He's just, I I honestly feel like if he wasn't Lonzo Ball and if he wasn't the second pick in the draft, he wouldn't be starting. Yeah. I I, I saw something today and um, I I saved it. He is on pace to become the second player in NBA history to log more than 30 minutes per game and shoot below 40% from the floor, 30% from three, and 60% from the free throw line. (sighs) Ah. Man, hopefully his brother will have a better impact in the league. I'm assuming as such. I've seen as such, so I'm hoping as such. Yeah. But 
We'll wait and see, my friend. You're a Lakers fan, even though you already have Anthony Davis or whatever, but you could have had Jason Tatum. Yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> I get reminded of that a lot, believe me. And I'll be rem- I'll be reminded of it later this week when they play the Celtics. Believe me, as, as I'm watching the game, that's what I'm going to be thinking about. We're signaling the ref for a quick timeout, but we'll be back with more of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. Hey, Lakers fans. Looking for the best place to go for up-to-date news, information, original videos, articles, podcasts, opinion pieces, and discussions about the world champion, Los Angeles Lakers? Well, look no further than Lakerholics.com. With a legion of followers always there talking about everything Lakers and the NBA, there's no better place to go to share your fandom as the team heads toward another championship run. So stop by and be part of the conversation today at Lakerholics.com. But my friend, it's been awesome having you on board. Once again, it is Rafael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies. Before we head on out, what you're working on? I know you haven't touched your site in a couple weeks, but Michael Weisenberg's there. His conversation's there, plus an introduction to the 2021 draft class. But before we head on out, what you working on for NBA Draft Junkies? Yeah, I have four videos done, and uh, I just need to add the voiceover. Uh, the past few weeks, I've been doing some NFL Combine stuff. No, I'm not starting a NFL Draft Junkies page. I used to be a huge, huge college football fan from Nebraska. So I used to know every recruit I knew, like, I mean, I knew college football like I knew basketball. Funny story, and, I, and I'll, uh, I'll get into what I'm doing. So I haven't watched college football in years, maybe like four years. So I do some training, and at this gym I train at, and there's a bunch of guys that are preparing for the combine. And one of the ladies that works at the gym, she suggested that if I wanted to do some filming or take pictures, because the combine is going to be virtual this year, maybe I can get the contract working with the, at the gym and doing some stuff for the NFL. So I've been working on that. So I'm talking to this guy and he's like the, the running backs are sitting out and they're doing their, they're doing their drills and this guy, he's sitting out. So he, he says to me, he says, um, are you taking pictures or video? Do you work for Exos, which is a gym? I say, no, I'm just, you know, doing the stuff and maybe possibly. So we start talking. We have a 45 minute conversation. He tells me that he's from California and he went to Alabama and so I'm like, oh, I said, oh, you just played. This is probably like three to three days after the national championship. He's like, yeah. So he says, I got to sit out. I can't work out till, till Monday, yada, yada, yada. And we're sitting there talking, like literally just talking about sports. And I go home and I said, let me look up and see who this is on the Alabama roster that I was just talking to. Didn't realize I was talking to Najee Harris. <laughs> for, oh, my gosh. For 45 minutes. <laughs> so uh, that's just how bad I am with college football now. So, but yeah, I've been doing that. It's kind of slowed up my progress. But I, I said I have four videos that I'm ready to upload. I just have to do the voiceovers. I talked myself into doing the voiceovers instead of just you know just dropping a video with a little clips here. I kind of helped you with those talking overs because I I kind of wanted you to do that. I thought yeah. it was a better look. Yeah. So that's that's the hold up. But my goal this week, like I'm in L.A. and I have more time than normal. I mean, I'm only working like one hour a day here. So I didn't bring my mic and stuff, but I'll have time to watch more prospects and and put together some clips. So next week I should have at least six or seven videos that I'll put out. Oh, that's awesome to hear. But it's so funny because Najee Harris is the star running back for the national champion Alabama Crimson Tide. I think if anybody's out there that knows or got a chance to see the game, I think he hurdled, if I remember correctly, one of the players that was on the other side. And I remember him distinctly on his his great running ability. And I think he's got a definitely a great future in the NFL going forward. But yeah, very athletic. Saw him on the dime leap over a defender. And I was just like, yeah, that kid's got it. That kid's got it. But yeah, I'm glad you got a chance to talk to him at least. Yeah, so man, I've talked to him a few times since then. Extremely nice guy. 
I mean, like I said, I did not, there was, I didn't know who it was, but there was nothing about him that said, I'm a star. Like, in my mind, I was thinking like, okay, maybe he's a, a hopeful, you know, maybe he's going to the combine and uh, he's training for it. Just as nice, one of the nicest athletes I've ever met. And so, uh, so yeah, it was pretty cool. So now I'm trying to catch up and watch college football and study because I don't even know who these players I'm talking to <laughs> every day. And I ended up like in their Instagram and, and, you know, just tagging them on pictures and come to find out it's like four or five guys that are projected to go in the first round. So I've been working on that. And then maybe, maybe, maybe if I keep my fingers crossed, best case scenario, trying to get a contract to do some stuff in the, in the G league bubble. So. I'm hoping for you, man. I'm pulling yeah. for you indeed. And Najee Harris uh, obviously is expected to go very high on that. I'm surprised he they, he wasn't talking about a pro day because they usually have like an Alabama pro day for just specifically for them. Yeah, I man, I'm sure they're going to have one. But right now everybody's preparing, you know, working on their like 40 times and, mm-hmm. and they're preparing in different – like I know there's a facility in Phoenix. There's one here in Southern California. Then they'll go back to their schools for pro day. But this was a good week for me to be here in L.A. because most of the guys are in Mobile for the Senior Bowl. Yeah. So it's kind of like a skeleton crew of of guys that are that are still in Dallas training. It's like mostly the guys that left school early. They weren't seniors. Yeah. One last thing when you're talking about all star games is the NBA might actually they're they're working on possibly agreeing to an NBA all star game in March. Like it or don't like it? I think it just adds an additional risk. Yeah, I mean, I figured they would just because of the networks. I mean, you figure if you have an all-star game in March and even if you have like the the dunk contest or – I mean, you won't have all the sponsored events, but I think that's big for the NBA as far as exposure. And I I figured that they were going to do it. Now, (laughs) Atlanta is probably not the best choice of cities. But I think the reason they're doing it is because the Turner crew won't have to um, go that they, far. Yeah, to go that far. Plus, it's uh, obviously one of the big, biggest hubs for airlines. And, and you know, it's, it's one of the easiest places to get to for all the different various airlines and whatnot. They're all going and merging into one place. Yeah, but that's the thing where, you know, like, are they going to make them stay in a bubble for a week if they fly, unless they fly private? I know last year I went to Chicago for All-Star game and while I'm at baggage claim I'm standing next to Aaron Gordon like he flew on a, a, a regular flight like like I did so I wonder is you know are the players going to have to fly private or if they fly you know regular <laughs> then are they going to have to quarantine because I think the airport is one of the riskier places to be so it's risky, but I can understand the financial implications, which would be the only reason I could see why these players are doing it and why the league's okaying it because of the financial implications involved for both sides. Bonuses, for, obviously, for the players and, and incentives are there on their side, plus also as well for the league. It's a way to go ahead and get that one big shot of adrenaline as far as advertising is concerned. But for me, I see it as a big risk on both sides. I mean, to me, this whole season is a risk. So an All-Star Weekend is a big moneymaker. Because even if they don't have fans there, if you're selling 2021 All-Star Game sweatshirts and paraphernalia at the airport in Atlanta, or I I think it can generate money. And then obviously, you know, you got somebody like LaMelo Ball, whose uh, All-Star Game is made for him, or, you know, like the rookie game. But if I read correctly, it's supposed to be a scaled down version, but I imagine they're still going to have the dunk contest, three point contest, rookie game. And the only differences are going to be, you know, maybe like the celebrity all-star games and, and just the whole fan interaction thing. But I mean, hopefully, it makes hopefully no Kenny Smith party. <laughs> no, you there definitely won't be any parties. Well, I'll tell you what, my friend, it's going to be very interesting to see if they do actually come away with an NBA All-Star game. And again, I appreciate all your time when talking about Sekou Smith, Kobe Bryant, of course, on the year after his passing, and all your thoughts on the NBA. 
Again, it's my good friend, Rafael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies. Please check out his site, nbadraftjunkies.com. And of course, his popular YouTube page, NBA Draft Junkies, the Run the Floor podcast. And you're still, I'm sure, on radio as well, correct? Yep. I just did a show uh, a couple of days ago. I did my mock draft. Um, so I have the audio version. And the audio version of my mock lottery is also on my podcast, so the NBA Draft Junkies podcast. So it's there. Uh, I want to put it on YouTube, but it was 55 minutes, and I just recorded it as, as a podcast. So I'm trying to figure out do I how many videos and graphics am I going to put up for 55 minutes to cover the the whole thing. So I have the time this week. It's just a matter of airport, not airport, but hotel Wi-Fi. Is it going to be good enough to upload a 55 minute video on YouTube? It may take three days. So we'll see. We'll see. I have lived through a hotel Wi-Fi. I know that can be a very painful situation for podcasters indeed, but check out Rafael Barlow on dash radio Monday still. Yep, Monday at 10 a.m. Central. So what is that, 8 a.m. Pacific and 11 a.m. Eastern. I mean, is there anybody in the mountain time zone? (laughs) (laughs) It's never listed. It's always, you know, it's always Eastern, Central, or or Pacific. So, but yeah, it's it's every Monday. So I guess on the West Coast, like I said, 8 a.m. Well, I'll tell you what, if Utah or Denver wins the NBA title, they might just go ahead and recognize Mountain Time from here on out. But we'll wait and see, my friend. It is Rafael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies. Tell you what, if you cannot, cannot do yourself any better by checking out all the NBA Draft prospects coming up at 4 2021's NBA Draft, plus there's so much more, check out Rafael's great stuff at NBA Draft Junkies on YouTube, NBADraftJunkie.com, and of course his podcast, The NBA Draft Junkies. Well, my friend, I really, truly appreciate it. Want to check in in two or three weeks? Check up the NBA? Anytime. Just let me know. You got it, my friend. Always good to hear from you. I want to again thank you so much for your thoughts on Seiku Smith. Again, all respects to his family. Our condolences. This coronavirus is its doing way too much damage and taking way too many people away from us. And, of course, we remember Kobe. And, again, I appreciate all your thoughts on the NBA as well. But it is Rafael Barlow. Hopefully you'll get a chance to check him out very soon at NBA Draft Junkies. And you're always a great part of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast.